Hi guys, today I'm bringing you the first in a series of videos looking at basic starting kit for reenacting the British Army during the Second World War, specifically in the Northwest European theatre, which is that most commonly uh, recreated by reenactment groups. So hopefully this will be of use to those who are looking to join the hobby. Uh, what I've tried to do is balance uh, between uh, best value for money uh, in terms of getting kit that will cover a longer time period, so stuff that will do early war the right the way through the war, and some items where that's not necessarily possible to do because certain items change and certain bits of very early war kit are difficult to find or more difficult to find. But I've tried to strike a balance with that. Most of the kit we're going to be looking at will carry you from late 1940 through to the end of the war. So a fairly good time span and therefore you're going to get good value for money out of the kit you buy. The first thing we're going to be looking at as I say in this part one video is basic uniform. We'll be looking from cap down to boots at the sort of thing you need to be looking to purchase and we'll start off looking at the battle dress uh, shirt and so on. The first thing we're going to look at is the basic battle dress uniform which consists of blouse here and we'll look at the trousers in a moment. This is a reproduction battle dress blouse made by Panther Store, and there's very good reproduction battle dress available on the market now, so it's definitely something you want to be looking to purchase fairly early on if you're looking to get into uh, reenacting the British Army in the Second World War. Uh, this is a battle dress surge, which is the first pattern of battle dress that was introduced. If you're interested to know more about that, I've already made a video looking at the a very ba on a very basic level, looking at the development of British battle dress throughout the war and the different patterns, and I'll put a, a link up in the corner of the video there if you're interested in seeing more of that. This is a say battle dress surge and it's the one I would recommend buying, the pattern I would recommend buying because it will carry you through the whole war, you can wear it through the whole period 1939 through 45. Uh, there are certainly there's photographs, Fusilier Pain uh, in Normandy in 1944, a famous series of photographs taken um, which are in the IWM collection which show uh, that he is wearing battle dress surge in, in Normandy in 1944 so it carried through that that long even though it had been out of production for a while. So if there's nothing wrong with it, it's going to be used until it's worn out. So it's the most versatile pattern to buy. Uh, this is the blouse, as I say, you can see pleated pockets, concealed buttons, an unlined collar, there's no collar lining. And the trousers here, these are also from Panther Store. You can see the label on the back there, they re reproduce the label. Uh, Panther Store specifically make these to both the original size range, uh, so the numbered sizes, and they'll also tailor make them as well, which is a useful thing. Uh, you can see battle dress serge trousers and they have the, the small single pleat dressing pocket on, the, on the, the right leg there. On the left leg you have the map pocket with the uh, concealed button flap there. So battle dress serge, the most versatile in terms of the fact it was introduced at the start of the war, or had been introduced by the start of the war, and was used, there are photographs showing this, fairly late war. Um, if the uniform isn't worn out it's going to continue being used, so that would be my recommendation. In addition to that, Although battle dress very early, if you're, if you're starting out battle dress, you can get away with wearing other things underneath. Definitely recommend picking up a khaki flannel shirt. And this is made of a, a khaki wool flannel with a, a cotton collar. There are various reproductions of these available. I think Panther Store make a very good example again. Um, I think Steve Kittle makes these as well. Uh, so getting a khaki flannel shirt is a very good idea because you can then wear the uniform in shirt sleeve order if you happen to be uh, take your battle dress blouse off, you've got the right clothing on underneath. So definitely a definitely a, a useful bit of kit to have and again something I would suggest getting early on if you uh, are looking at starting British reenacting in the second, British Second World War reenacting that is. Um, in addition to this you're going to want to get a set of braces to support the trousers. When wearing the trousers and blouse together Although the trousers can be supported with a belt, when wearing blouse and trousers together, the most convenient way of supporting the trousers is with a pair of braces. These are an original pair, which I purchased, which have had one of the, they'd been damaged, one of the straps has been re replaced with this riveted on. So I don't mind using these as a wearing pair um, because they're not in, in particularly good condition. I do have a pair for the collection as well. The uh, proper cotton ones, of course, do have the problem of possibly popping buttons. I believe Soldier of Fortune make white elastic braces, which aren't strictly accurate, but are better than wearing, say, the post-war grey elastic braces. You could also wear civilian braces, so braces with a stripe in the elastic, perhaps. Or, if you're so inclined, you could get a modern braces and take the metal fittings and things off and attach them to uh, some white cotton uh, strap uh, if you wanted to make your own. That's another option that you have there. Um, but there are various options for doing this, but a pair of braces to support the trousers is another uh, part of the starting kit you're going to want to pick up. 
So that's a look at the basic uniform. We'll go on to look at headdress now. OK, so we're moving on now to look at headdress. And for the majority of British units, uh, headdress is fairly standardised. That excludes, of course, airborne forces, commandos and uh, tankies who wore various colours of beret. Um, the basic headdress for infantry, for bog standard infantry, early through mid-war, is the field service cap. So this is what I've included here as the basic starting kit. Uh, there's no one, unfortunately, who makes a decent reproduction of these, so it's something you're going to have to look at, uh, look out for uh, an original if you want to get it as something that looks correct. Um, the originals are made of gabardine cloth, and most of the reproductions I've seen are made of serge, which is incorrect, and the shape is often not entirely accurate. So a reproduction is not really an option in this case. You're going to have to try and find an original. They're worn one size larger than you would normally have, so I normally take a seven and an eighth, and this original here is seven and a quarter because of the way they're worn over on the side of the head, they need to be sized up a size larger. Uh, so if you're doing early through mid-war, you need to be picking up a field service cap and an original is unfortunately the only way to go really. Later in the war, the general service cap would come in, which is basically a large khaki originally made in, in gabardine like the um, field service cap then made in serge. It's basically a beret um, in, in form and how it's worn. Uh, reproductions of these can be picked up um, I believe Panther Store make reproductions of these, which are, which are pretty good. Their cloth and everything is very good. Uh, this is an original, and originals are not hard to find. So this may be something you want to, again, look at purchasing an original item. For late war reenacting, this is the head, headgear to go for in the Northwest European theatre. So that would be another piece of, of uh, initial uh, uniform I would recommend purchasing as a GS cap. So the next thing we're going to talk about is boots. And you're going to want to get a pair of these. British Army ammo boots. Um, they're made in pebble grain leather, as you can see there, um, in the mi mid-1990s or into the 2000s. I'm not entirely sure when the British Army changed their parade boots to a smooth leather example with a different shape of toe cap, uh, which is more pointed. You don't want to get those. They aren't accurate. Um, look out for a proper pair of these with the, the grained leather and the sort of rounded toe cap there. You can see the design clearly. If we have a look around here, you can see the design of the seams and so forth as well. Have a good look at the... Everything there. Leather laces, of course. Um, as I say, these can be found on eBay. You can find these and at shows. Um, they're probably going to be one of the more expensive things you buy if you have large feet, particularly if you're looking for a large size. But if you look after them, uh, they will last for a very long time. Uh, if you keep the soles in good repair, keep them well dubbined. Uh, I've had these for the past 10 years and they're, they're really nicely worn in, they're like a pair of slippers. Uh, they're really comfortable. So definitely something you want to spend a bit of money on. There are reproductions of these available, none of which are particularly accurate. Uh, I believe What Price Glory make them, uh, but unfortunately they have a smooth toe cap and smooth heel, which is incorrect. Um, you you really want one that has the pebble grain all over. And this is a, an original pair. These are 1990s dated, or I think they are anyway, from the 90s. And they haven't been bulled, which is where the, the guards... Uh, basically polish the whole boot with beeswax um, to get a mirror shine across the whole thing, uh, which is a relatively modern thing. Originally, it was just heels and toes. Um, but relatively recently, uh, the 80s, possibly, or the 70s, the whole boot would be covered in, in beeswax. You can find boots like this, and sometimes it's possible to scrape the beeswax off and get back to a, a leather finish. But they're often dried out by the process because of all the burning and everything that goes on and the, the ironing to get the the grain ironed out and that's another thing is if you scrape the, the beeswax off you like to find underneath that the pebble grain finish has been ironed smooth which is not what you want for the second world war boots tended to be dubbed for use in the field as opposed to highly polished so you really want the natural leather finish with this this grain to it so keeping an eye out for a good pair of these boots is a key thing to do if you're joining the hobby and uh, if you get a good pair and look after them they'll see you through uh, probably your entire reenacting uh, life so yeah that's the, the British Army ammo boot. Once you're sorted with boots, you'll need to get yourself a pair of these uh, anklets. Uh, now, what I'm showing you here are the easiest to find that will carry you through the longest period of the war. Uh, these have uh, these are actually Indian made. They're the only examples of these I have. Uh, but they have the webbing straps um, rather than leather. The leather came in a little bit later in the war. I've seen a pair of these dated 1940 with just the plain webbing straps. Very early in the war, they came with, I happen to have a pair here, with uh, brass tips on the end of the strap, as you can see there. These are somewhat difficult to find, so these would be easier, and they still cover a good uh, time frame. 
um, they're versatile in that regard. So a pair of original, if you can find them, there are reproductions of these available, which aren't too bad. Um, I think Soldier of Fortune make them. I'm not sure what the quality is, but if you're buying from Soldier of Fortune or, or other um, vendors like that, it's often best to buy in person to make sure you're getting good quality because some batches can vary. Um, but I say originals of these aren't particularly hard to find, particularly at shows and things. And they are available on eBay as well. Price is creeping up on them, but they are a very useful and essential bit of kit to get early on. So there we have a look at the very basics of British Army uniform during the Second World War. Looking at basic infantry as opposed to airborne forces or anything like that. So the headdress is not specific to those units. If you're wanting to represent different units, obviously your headdress may vary. But battle dress was pretty much universally issued, so it's a good basic starting uniform to look at getting before buying denizens or anything like this. The next video will cover basic web equipment that you'll be wanting to look to purchase if joining the hobby for the first time. Uh, if you enjoy this content and my uploads and would like to see more, then please consider subscribing. Um, I have uh, more videos upcoming and obviously more parts in this series. And if you do subscribe, make sure you hit the notification button so that you are notified when I do upload future videos. I also have a Facebook page and an Instagram, which are linked to the channel. Uh, links to which I will put in the description where I put up more photographs of the collection and so forth. And it's a good place to contact me to ask me questions and things because obviously YouTube's own messenger service isn't very good. And uh, that's it for now. So until next time, bye for now.